So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to another NetPlay seminar. Today's speaker is um, Gonzalo Contreras Asso, and he's going to talk about spectral analysis of Viper graph. And then in the discussion part, we're going to um, talk and discuss experience of peer review in interdisciplinary research. So Gonzalo, whenever you want. Okay. Um, well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about my, my research and uh, the discussion that follows. So um, as you can see, I will talk about hypergraphs. I am a physicist, but uh, I, I'm doing a PhD in applied mathematics. So this will have some technical uh, things that are kind of interesting. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think they can be useful tools that maybe you want to, to know about. So basically this is the, what I'm going to be discussing. I'm going to first introduce what centrality is, very general. Then I'm going to discuss uh, what has been done in hypergraphs, this paper by Benson, the three eigenvector centrality paper. It has a very important shortcoming. So I'm going to try to fix it with the third uh, section. Uh, which is something we are uh, we submitted for publishing last year. We are still waiting for the reviews. And finally, I'm going to tell you what we've been working on during these last couple of months, uh, which is introducing some notion of directedness in hypergraphs. So without further ado, centrality is one of the most important things that people study in complex networks. It's just uh, assigning uh, an importance to each node in the network. Well, sorry. So this depends on the type of network that you're considering, and it also depends on what you mean by importance. So, but mathematically, we can just say that the centrality is a function from the nodes to the positive numbers, such that every node has a, a score, a centrality score. This assignment should be unique and it should have a heuristics, some kind of meaning. So here you can see some examples. So if you consider that the most important node is the one that has the most connections, then you should be using the degree centrality. If you think that the most important node is the one with the most shortest paths going through it, then between us is your, your, most, impo more, your more relevant uh, measure. And well, there, plenty of measures that one can choose. Here you can see uh, it's, um, a simple network, network with some examples of these uh, most uh, central nodes with respect to some um, measures. And the thing is that some of these measures are of a special kind. They are special uh, spectral centralities, like the eigenvector centrality, which I'll be discussing next, or PyTran, the one that, you, that Google used to, to use. And they are special because they are tractable. So they, are, they have some kind of analytical solution in many cases, and they are faster to compute than, for instance, computing shortest paths in a network, which is very time consuming. Let's focus on the eigenvector. So the eigenvector centrality is a, um, ha has the following heuristics. So it's not only the number of connections what matters, it all also matters how important your connections are. So here you can see an example. So the person on the right is a friend of Gauss and the person on the left is a friend of myself and my friend Kirill. Uh, but even though the person on the left has two connections, those are meaningless connections. So the person on the right is more important because they are connected to Gauss. Mathematically, you can start uh, writing, writing this out. And the thing is that you arrive at the eigenvector equation of the transposed adjacency matrix. And there's a very important result in linear algebra, which is that if the graph is strongly connected, then basically you have guaranteed the uniqueness and existence of one eigenvector, which is positive. And, uh, and that's basically all the requirements you want from a centrality measure, existence, uniqueness, and positivity. So basically the eigenvector corresponding to the uh, spectral radius of the adjacency matrix is a valid centrality measure and it is employed in many places. For instance, Google in the in page rank uses a variation of this method. And it's also fast to compute because the power method that we all know from numerical analysis 
allows us to compute the second vector really, really fast. So this is the story for standard graphs. Now, what happens in hypergraphs? Well, hypergraphs are the new, the new toy uh, that we want everyone wants to explore. And basically, they model systems where interactions take place between more than two individuals. And uh, a lot of people are trying to extend what has been done in networks to the context of hypergraphs. Now, Benson proposed an extension of the eigenvector centrality to this setting, and I'm going to tell you about it now. So first of all, uh, we need to understand that there are certain properties of uh, hypergraphs that are relevant. The first one is uniformity. So a two uniform hypergraph only has pairwise interactions. A three uniform hypergraph only have has triadic interactions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, we have strong connectedness, which based, I'm not going to go into the details, but basically a strong connected hypergraph uh, requires that when you project it down to a pairwise one, it is strongly connected. That's very reasonable. Again, I'm not going to go into the details. But with that being said, uh, basically this is the recipe that you want from a spectral centrality. You want a function of your centrality to be proportional to a function of your neighbor's centralities plus your triadic neighbor's centralities plus etc. But this is clearly very complicated and usually this, this doesn't have a, a solution in general. So you need to specify functions f and the different g's. So there's one option, which is linear f and linear g's. That turns out to lead back to the eigenvector equation of the projected network, which is not very interesting. And it also loses all the nonlinear character that hypergraphs could be introducing. So we can dismiss that one. And there are two nonlinear ones that one can think of and that actually have a solution. And this is um, what we're going to discuss now. But the problem is that they require you to have a uniform hypergraph. So we can just consider a hypergraph where only three interactions are present, and then we can define these two measures. Let, let me tell you about these two measures. So the first one is comes from something called the Z eigenvectors and eigenvalues of a, of a tensor. First of all, uh, well, I'm going to be saying tensor all the time. Actually, a tensor is something much more important in physics. Uh, here, I'm going to say tensor, but I just uh, mean hypermatrix. But let's get it, get that out of the way. So if you have a, a tensor from a three um, hypergraph, three uniform hypergraph, then basically you can have this equation. This equation has a problem, which is that you need to fix the length of the centrality vector C. Why is that? Because suppose that you could scale it, then you have uh, you scale it twice on the right and only once on the left. So basically, also the eigenvalues are scaled. One does not want to scale eigenvalues. Eigenvalues should be unique. That's why you need to fix one length, and then you get unique eigenvalues for this measure. And that's uh, going to be relevant later. There's another option, which is H eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Basically, here you have your centrality squared. This fixes this kind of scalability problem. So now you can scale vectors without any problem because you scale twice on the left and twice on the right, so everything works. And, um, and these two measures, they have been studied in the mathematical literature of these hypermatrices, and they have existence of positivity theorems. So nice, but what's the difference? Well, the Z eigenvalues and eigenvectors are basically a disaster. They may not be unique, they can't be scaled, as we discussed uh, right before. They are hard to compute. Uh, well, complete disaster. And the other ones are amazing. So basically, this is the summary of, uh, of the previous slide, but uh, in a shorter version. That's what we have to keep in mind. So with that uh, already discussed, uh, I'm going to tell you what we did, which is, OK, there's a big problem which is what we said about uniformity. That those measures work when you only have one type of interaction. So only three interactions, only four interaction, only one type. So what, if you, I give you a random hypergraph with a lot of interactions, you can just examine it layer by layer. So interaction by interaction. The problem is that if you do that analysis, maybe you get the following situation. Here you have this hypergraph, which is perfectly valid. It's like reasonably connected. But when you examine it from a pairwise uh, level and from a triadic level, 
you find that it's not even strongly connected if you try to do that analysis at each level. So basically you will get a bit of nonsense or maybe you get different results. And I thought of the following analogy because maybe you know this book, it's a very famous book, <clears throat> the Godel Esther Bach, Bach book. And here it's like the hypergraph is the thing on the, in the middle. And depending on how you look at it, so depending on how you, which order you choose, you see a completely different thing that might even be nonsense. So we want to fix this problem. We want to actually have a spectral centrality that uses these tools, but does not require you to have a uniform hypergraph. So let's let's uh, get on with it. Here we have this equation that we described before for the H eigenvectors in the case of two and three interactions. Supposedly we cannot deal with this thing, but actually we can because suppose that I do this, I introduce another node called star, an auxiliary node with another centrality, and then I can sum the two the two sums, and that's it. And uh, I mean, you at some point should complain because you should be like, okay, why can you do this? Uh, is this allowed? Is there some, I don't know, why can you, you know, can you do this? But even if you can do it, you should adjust some combinatorial factors. That's something we do in the, in the paper. I'm not going to discuss that now. And then we have to show why it is more relevant studying things this way. So first of all, let me convince you. So the thing is that in order for you to be able to do this transformation, you need the centrality of this auxiliary node that you add to be one. Because if it's one, you can see that the, the sum with the centrality and the sum without the centrality are exactly the same. So basically that's your only requirement that when you compute the centralities, you can scale the resulting eigenvector such that the centrality of the extra node that you're adding is one. And that is another reason why the eight eigenvalues and eigenvectors are much better because as you can scale them and the other ones you can't, you can actually perform this uniformization if you want to call it like that. And uh, also this removes these constraints. This constraint removes the possibility of having multiple extra nodes. You can only have one auxiliary node because you can only ensure that its centrality will be one. If you have two nodes, you cannot ensure that both will always be one. And uh, so, so the recipe that we give is the following. You give me a hypergraph with a lot of interactions. I choose an order in between. I uplift, which is what we call this procedure that I told you about. I add a node that uh, makes interactions of the correct order from the lower order ones. I project down, so I break down higher interactions into smaller ones. I adjust some combinatorial factors. This is the boring part. And then finally, I have a uniform hypergraph that comes from compressing the uh, whole hypergraph into one order. So I have a uniform hypergraph and I can study its eigenvectors. So now I only have to show you why this is relevant. So remember the picture in the beginning of the, of the cover of, the, of, the, of this book. So what we want is to have the same centrality no matter how you look at it. So no matter which order you choose, you should see the same thing. And we checked this with this um, data set. It's the tags as Ubuntu data set. It's a hypergraph constructed from uh, interactions in a, an online forum. And if you compute the Kendall Tau ranking comparison, uh, the closer to, to one it is, the, the more similar the rankings or the centralities are. And we see that no matter how you look at it, with, with our method, you're very close to one. So basically we all always have the same uh, ranking of the nodes and with the original approach of, okay, just look at two interactions, look at three interactions, look at four interactions, you get completely dissimilar rankings. So this is, a, I think it's a very nice uh, result, this one. And to finalize this, this talk, um, I'm going to give you a glimpse of what uh, hopefully we'll submit to the archive uh, next week. So the thing is that uh, after finishing this project, we were left out with, okay, what can we do now? And the most natural thing to do is, okay, let's try to add some kind of directedness in the interactions. 
And the thing is that this has already been studied in the hypergraph literature, the so-called directed hypergraphs, which I will very briefly tell you about. But actually, we can go even further because um, let's let's start from the beginning. Suppose you have a standard graph. What does it mean for you to have a directed edge between, for instance, nodes one and two? You have an ordered pair, one, two, right? Or you have two distinct uh, components in the adjacency matrix. So A12 is not the same as A21. So basically you have two numbers and they specify two possible directions. In a hypergraph, the amount of symmetry, let's say that you have between the components of this tensor will also specify the amount of directions that you can have. So for instance, if you have nodes one, two, and three, if you have complete symmetry between the three of them, then you have an undirected interaction because the six components associated to nodes one, two, and three will, will all, uh, be the same. But if you break more or less this symmetry, if you allow each of these components, one, two, three, one, three, two, three, two, one, et cetera, to have different values, then you will have up to six different possible interactions between those three nodes. So that's the main idea. Instead of focusing on the set theoretic description of an interaction, let's focus on the algebraic description of an interaction. And the thing is in hypergraphs, everyone has studied set theoretic descriptions of these things, of directed hypergraphs. Because if you look in the literature of uh, directed hypergraphs, you will see that interactions have input nodes and output nodes. So a set of input nodes in, an, in a hyperedge and a set of output nodes in a, in a hyperedge, but nothing, nothing more. So you have symmetry between the input components, symmetry between the output components, that's it. But if you think about this from this algebraic perspective, you can have a plethora of uh, types of hypergraphs. So for instance, instead of having complete symmetry between three nodes, you could have just the odd symmetries, like in this, peak, uh, in this pink hypergraph here. So you would have some kind of cyclical hyperedge. What does it mean? I don't know. We have some ideas. We do have some ideas of possible applications of not, not exactly this, this kind, but other kinds of uh, things that you can describe by breaking these symmetries in the, in the adjacency tensor. But that's the, the, the main, one of the main uh, points of our, of our uh, article. So instead of focusing on the set theoretic description of a hypergraph as a set of uh, input nodes, output nodes, et cetera, focus on the adjacency tensors, and then you will get very fancy structures. So this is basically what we are wrapping up. Uh, wrapping up. I would have liked to have it um, submitted to archive this week such that I could present it uh, completely here, but uh, next week we'll probably be able to do so. And we yeah, discuss all of this that I told you. We discuss what does it mean to transpose a tensor to compute these centralities. Uh, and we also have some numerical examples with uh, chemical reactions and, and transportation networks. And yeah, that basically concludes uh, this part of the talk. Um, yeah, I, I presented the value, I think valuable uh, tool, this uh, uniformization of a hypergraph. And then I gave you some a glimpse of uh, what's, what's to come. That's, and those are the references. Okay, thank you very much, Gonzalo. If anyone has question on this part, please. If okay. so I, I have some questions. Go on. Yeah. Um can you go back to, to, to you had one slide with a heat map uh, with some results with yes. Uh, this one. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't really understood uh, here the, the point yeah. of view. Can you explain it? Yes. Okay. So, okay, maybe this is a very compressed um, uh, slide. So the thing is, uh, there's this data set. It's a hypergraph with, I don't remember how many nodes and interactions, but it has five orders, uh, sorry, four orders. So it has pairwise interactions. It has triadic interactions, four interactions and five interactions, right? Mm -hmm. So the thing is in the original paper by Benson, he takes this hypergraph, literally this hypergraph, uh, 
And he says, okay, if I only look at pairwise, so he removes any possible three interaction, four interaction, five interaction, he gets a ranking. He then looks at three, three interactions, he gets another ranking. He looks up for, at four interactions, another ranking. Five interactions, another ranking. Now, if you compare the, for instance, the five here, this 0 0.55, the red one, the red most one, is comparing the ranking from the two interactions with the ranking from the three interactions. And it's 0 0.5, it's not even close to one. So it really is showing you a completely different ranking. It is showing you that it has classified nodes because I don't know, maybe some nodes are very important for pairwise interactions, but mm -hmm. some other nodes are not very relevant in five interactions, which is a valid point. I mean, maybe you're interested in understanding the role of each node in each interaction, in its order of interaction. But if you want, if I give you a hypergraph, you want to have like a complete description of this hypergraph without separating in interactions. Right. Yeah, so okay, okay, yeah. So um, U is uh, U is the uniformized version that we propose. So, so method basically. The yeah. So U two U two is projecting all the uh, higher interactions to order two. U three is uplifting the ones from two to three and projecting down the other ones, etc. Okay. So basically, no matter where you put the, uh, yeah, what, no matter which order you look at it, if you do this uniformization, you completely agree on the on which are the most important nodes. I have another question for first of all, thank you for the talk. It was very nice. Um, thank you for the the at the end you said uh, about directed hyper edges, and you have yeah. some idea, and then I missed if. You had a concrete idea what how a directed hyper edges could look like. I mean, so like the... like data or like how how would you visualize this? Because you, I guess, you have two source nodes and one one target node, or vice versa, or something like this. So, so the the point is, uh, up until now, there have been like plenty of papers in the both the mathematical and the, and the computer science literature on directed hypergraphs, but they have only discussed the case of directed hypergraphs where one interaction has some input nodes and some output nodes. For instance, in wow. this in this edge, uh, in this sorry, in this orange uh, hyper edge, you have two nodes that are like the sources of the interaction and three nodes that are like the targets of the interaction. So that that orange hyper edge is basically everything that has been discussed up, up until now. Nothing else, because people have tended to have this set theoretic uh, mindset of collections of nodes, uh, sets of nodes. Uh, some set is the input, some set is the, is the output, but you can have much different things that may not be described by set theory. Um, for instance, this, this pink thing, this pink thing, maybe you can think of it as an ordered set, but not really because then when, it, so you have one, two, three, and then one. So it's like cyclical. A cyclic set, I don't even know if that's a thing in mathematics, mm. uh, but it is a thing from the adjacency tensor perspective, because you you could have that one, two, three, uh, and three, one, two, and two, one. Well, uh, I don't know, the, the cyclic, uh, the, the even permutations of one, two, and three, and those would be uh, a tensor component mm -hmm. with the same uh, yeah, number, let's say. How does data look like uh, that has directed hyper edges? I mean, just uh, is there something? Do you know? Yes. So in the traditional directedness, you can think of many uh, examples. So for instance, propositional logic is an example. So I give you a set of uh -huh. propositions, and you tell me which are the logical conclusions. Okay. Uh, or, or you can, uh, an example that we constructed and we actually analyzed is from chemical reaction data. You have some uh, in, uh, input with the reactants and the products, right? Metabolical reactions, everything that is a reaction that has input output. So it's actually easy to come up with this example. Yeah, but yeah. We, actually, yes. But even with, uh, we, we have another example with uh, non directed uh, uh, hypergraphs, which are still heterogeneous. We call these things heterogeneous. 
because for instance in citation networks like citations networks are one of the most uh, the fundamental blocks of uh, complex network theory right so people first studied them with pairwise interactions people then studied them with okay let's have a paper being the uh, a hyper a uh, hyper edge between the authors but actually if the order of the authors matter in a paper then you actually have a heterogeneous hyper edge because mm -hmm. You have an order in the nodes. It's not only that they are a hyper edge, they are also an ordered hyper edge. So it's not exactly a directed, it's not input output. It's something in between. And you can describe this with the adjacency tensor. Wow. Okay. That that makes sense. That's cool. Thank you. Do you have some applications in mind uh, for uh, for this framework? Because I I'm working on directed hypergraphs, but we are working mainly on standard definition of a set, uh, head set and a tail set of uh, in in the hypergraph in the hmm. edge. Yeah. So do, do you have some? I mean, something else uh, that is not like co-authorship in in mind. For instance, uh, I mean, okay. For, first of all, let me clear this out. So this uh, work is mostly. Uh, theoretical so yeah, yeah it's not that we focus on applications but, st but still we are thinking of okay where could this be applied if yeah, ever. yeah if you have some and some ideas yes mm -hmm. i have another idea which is uh, transportation networks because okay. for instance if you have a company say amazon that moves items from one place to another suppose that you have some trucks that always perform the same route so the, that route would be a hyper edge, which is again ordered, but it's not source uh, source uh, yeah target because maybe it passes through different destinations. So yes, it has one source, the uh, I don't know the uh, storage uh, unit, and it has a lot of places that it always goes through. So if you have a, a yeah a collection of these routes that these trucks um, use to del deliver the goods, then basically you have a heterogeneous hyper edge that is not directed. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, it's maybe a esoteric uh, thing, but it's something that we no, no, I, thought could I, be I could also, be applied to. I was also thinking in this direction. I mean, you, you can define directness in a lot of way on, on hypergraphs. And I was also yeah. thinking of uh, in, in this direction. That, that's why I was uh, curious on. Uh, yeah. yeah, having an ordering of all the nodes in, in a... but yeah. uh, my only application was it for co-authorship data. That's why I, I asked because I mean that's a bit trivial to to, to yeah to put an ordering on on authors because it makes sense. Yeah, yeah I, so I'm I, hoping... I agree. It can be can be interesting. I think it's tricky, but I'm hoping that this uh, plants the seed for a lot of people to start thinking of okay, maybe I could apply this to I don't know fauna or. Uh... I don't know wildlife. I have no idea. I will. I also said one one other question just there, and then, and then yeah. I will stop. Sure. Um, sure, sure. Like a, maybe a bit more technical. When you like, uh, you have this process of uplifting in your, um, in yes. your method, but you also have this uh, process of sort of projecting Project. down. Yes. When you project down. Don't you have similar problems on when you treat hypergraphs as graphs in 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 sense that if you have, for example, an interaction of size five hundred, mm -hmm. and then you project down, you create a lot of hyperedges, really small hyperedges, and yes, this mess it's... up with your measure. Uh, well, you you need to adjust the combinatorial factors. That's something that I skipped, but yes, it's uh, it was a bit. Uh... Uh, yeah, uh, I, we struggle to actually make the combinatorial factors right, but yes, you need to make sure that you don't drown the actual interactions. But still, if you have a 500 interaction, then basically that's going to. I mean, if you have a, a hypergraph that spans from two to 500, mm -hmm. basically any result is going to be a mess. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, at at that point, like, uh, what can you do? Okay, but yeah, yeah. We, we also don't don't have any example of a uh, a hypergraph which has 
so many layers of interaction. We do have some simple examples. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you about uh, okay. other, yeah. Okay, uh, then that's nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, if someone has other question about the uh, research topic or not, I don't think so. So we can switch to the second part. I don't know if you have a slide or you just want to. If you don't mind, I can just stop sharing because I uh, would like this to be more like an open discussion of what problems sure. we've all faced and. Uh... Sure, no problem. So uh, perhaps then I uh, I should start. So as you can tell by this uh, presentation, I'm in the middle in the middle between mathematics and physics. So I personally have uh, struggled in the past with uh, yeah with uh, submitting papers to interdisciplinary journals and being kicked by both sides. So if uh, yeah. A mathematician comes along, they are like, okay, this uh, is not very rigorous. This lacks uh, formality, this uh, blah, blah, blah. If uh, someone which is very um, yeah out, the, out of the mathematical formalism comes along, they can say, okay, what's this thing? Theorem, lemma, corollary, proof, blah, blah, blah. This is nonsense. Just give me a simulation. Um, so I, I personally have struggled with, with this and I'm still learning uh, how to deal with this effectively. I do not have a clear answer. Um, and I don't know, I think it's uh, a bit um, frustrating in this field, which is very interdisciplinary. And uh, should you just change journal, try something else? Should you? actually try to convince the referee that what you're doing is sensible. It's just that they don't know about the how you're doing things, or maybe you, you should be like, okay, look at this paper in this same journal that does the same things. Uh, maybe it's you that it's uh, uh, the person who is wrong. I don't know. What, what do you guys think about this? Have you faced uh, some similar issues or? Oh, uh, can I ask in, in what journals did you then publish it? Like what uh, were they more physicsy then or more mathy or were they like true inter interdisciplinary? Because I think the, the problem is mostly that this true interdisciplinary never never exists. Everybody yeah. says, Oh yeah, we want interdisciplinary this and interdisciplinary this, and we are an interdisciplinary channel of what whatever, but it's just goes as far as the referees are willing to do it or the editors are willing to to enforce it. Yeah, but you know, even in the even in the in the case of every referee being from, a, for instance, a physics background, you can have people who are more comfortable with uh, mm -hmm. like uh, algebra, or people who are more comfortable, for instance, uh, uh, in this is also something that I face when I read papers uh, about, for instance, page rank. So page rank is uh, this algorithm that you, Google uses, blah blah blah, and it uh, it has a very strong connection with linear algebra, which is the one that I'm most familiar with, but it also has a lot of connection with stochastic processes and Markovian chains and this kind of stuff. And it's a completely different language. So you can have a referee, two referees that are both physicists, but they come from very different backgrounds in the same journal. And you know, that raises the same issues, mm -hmm. even in the same journal with the same kind of background. It's just the two disciplines within the same background more or less yeah you're right also it feels like the 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 biggest problem is that nobody wants to compromise what is important to them yeah and uh, it's very hard to cater to an audience that that uh, <laughs> like wants very different things sometimes so i think this is very very tough i, I agree yeah what about the rest have you faced uh, similar issues Mm, I don't know actually because I always like 
only published in a, in a journal. I published, no, three papers, two of them in a journal. Um, mm, just, I, I mean, there are some general things that people do that if the topic is really um, different from what is it's never really different because you I mean they choose a referee that should be uh expert on your on your topic. But hmm. if it differ from your point of view or um okay you're not on the same side, uh they will criticize it without without even having like yeah not not the whole of them but the majority. Um, without even uh, like try to understand what is your point, what is the point of the paper, yeah. they they just look okay. This is different from what I know, so it's not good. <laughs> um, but I I don't know I don't know if to relate this to the fact that I'm doing interdisciplinary research or how the the peer review is. Uh, is yeah. in general right now probably we experience more of that because of because of, of the interdisciplinary research mm, it could be yeah i don't know i i think it, our research is interdisciplinary in very different ways because for instance yes there's uh, math physics but for instance there are papers that are uh, very analytical are, and some that are very numerical, some that are theoretical, some that are applications. So it's like you have to mm, try to contort yourself to actually fit the needs of all the referees. And uh, I find this very frustrating. Guillermo. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> just thinking about the many things. I mean, I, I've been doing also uh, yeah, research interdisciplinary between fields and everything. I remember my first experience in the in the PhD was uh, we we did a paper. My supervisor, I was in the computer science department, but my supervisor is a statistical physician, and yeah, it was mostly complex networks, a complex systems approach, and it was like the we we submit to a to one of the typical computer science conferences. The reviews they like, were really not getting anything at all. They, they were their comments were so off. It was like really yep. the 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 idea of doing a mean field approximation that that's something that they could not comprehend and, and understand <laughs> or an analytical approximation to understand. So that that was that was yeah that was very frustrating uh, for sure. I've been having other experiences now. Well, actually, my project now is uh, healthcare using healthcare data, and we are collaborating with people from from medicine. And I, I've been working on a paper um, to a journal uh, from the Lancet group, which has very good standards. And and in this one, actually, they they assign five reviewers to the paper, out of which. Three were from medical background and two were from statistics. And you could see like they were experts in statistics. And they will, each of them, they were, they were addressing the sites that they could address. So that was a very good experience. And, and, I, and I, way like you, I could see like this uh, very good model of you have a few reviewers and you, yeah, you, you, you can make sure that they are coming from different backgrounds so that they can understand and they can. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's always, I mean, there's always, uh, what would you say about, I mean, the way of, of conduct, conducting research may be indeed very different from different disciplines. And, and there's always an effort that needs to be put for going and understanding the other side. And of course, if the reviewers don't do that effort, then there's not much that, that can be done. So it always takes a bit of open mind. Yeah. I think five reviewers, it's uh, crazy. Uh, maybe you said something about health uh, related things and maybe there's there needs to be more supervision here. I think it's, uh, it's probably a nightmarish experience having five referees. 
Also, finding yeah. five referees. Uh... Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, I have, I have to say, like, they, they, they are a good journal, so they, they, they yeah. have the resources and they do spend the resource, you know, on being rigorous and being to that level. Yeah. And I feel like, for instance, the editors, like, they are, they are jobs, like, they are people that, whose job are not paid to be an editor of the journal, which in most cases is just people who voluntarily yeah. are editors and have no time for looking for people and all this, managing all these things. So I guess yeah. to some extent, yeah, there, there's always, this opens the, the thing about journals and reviews and the system and the incentives and... Yeah, uh, <laughs> actually, I, I, I did have a plan, some kind of a subsection of this uh, discussion, which is yeah, the system, <laughs> because, yeah. you know, we we are uh, like uh, the new generation of uh, scientists that is coming along and we are inheriting these random structures that you're like, OK, well, who designed this and on whose mind uh, does this uh, make sense? And, uh, you know, I, I also have some. Uh, experience with with for instance i i know that there's another system which is called peer witnessing instead of the peer reviewing that we are all used to and we should push towards the adoption of this because for instance something that annoys me a lot is when you know that a referee is telling you okay you haven't added these five references and the five are sharing one author and they are completely unrelated to to what you've done so that happens and that is allowed because no one sees what's happening under the curtains. But actually in a peer witness model, that vanishes. No one is going to be exposed like that. And uh, I don't know, there are so many things that go wrong. Like, uh, I don't know, what, what do you guys think? Uh, a question, how does the peer witness work? And it's uh, actually some journal like uh, yes. it. Okay. Yes, actually, I uh, there's a it's a good journal. It's called SciPost, and I know about it because uh, my um, one of my my condensed matter professor, my master, he is basically the founder of this thing, and it's completely non-profit organization, free for authors, free for uh, viewers everything good and they have this peer witness it, it's it's the reason i know about this model this peer witnessing thing and basically it works like this the uh the web page the journal itself more or less it's it's a web page and it already has some kind of preprint uh, server like archive and so you can upload things to to yeah to this um to this web page and they are a preprint and they are assigned some reviewers but everyone sees the reviews it's like if you log in to the web page, you can even be a, a reviewer if you want. So you see the papers that are uploaded to uh, there and they are like preprints and you are like, okay, I want to review this one. So you add a comment and everyone sees what everyone else has written, but it's anonymous or it cannot, it, it can be not anonymous. If you feel confident that you put your name and everyone sees that you made that comment, but it, you can also do it anonymously, but everyone sees it. So you basically, avoid all these people because uh, if someone says okay i have these five references that i want you to add in a closed um, refereeing you need to add them otherwise that guy is going to say reject this paper but if you are in a peer witness thing you can say okay i don't want to add this because here you can all see that this is completely unrelated so it's a very nice model but in, uh, in machine learning, in some machine learning um, conferences, they have like open review in the sense that uh, people are assigned to a paper, but the, the paper is uh, public. So everybody can see the paper. And also the review sure. are, publics, are public and people can co comment on under the, the review and also the authors can comment under the review. Yeah. And also the des decision is public with the comments but of course it, it is they are not journals they are conferences so after uh, sometimes they have a rebuttal but usually they have a decision and in this case is public and motivated publicly 
and they can also have a rebuttal so people can reply to the decision but then there is a final decision yeah it's uh, a more dynamic it's a dynamic yeah. process where everything comes Probably. to synchrony at some point no no it could be also interesting to have something like archive but with comments so maybe keeping yes both so people can have some feedbacks and then can submit yeah. and maybe su submitting also the the comments that they received so there's some sort of Mm, review that's already been done with, through these feedbacks. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind, kind of like a forum of discussion yeah. that you have people that will discuss and people can comment, or people can comment on top and reply and add. But this, this is what, what you are also saying, right, Gonzalo? Like the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, I, I, sorry, I ask all the time, like the only reason we need kind of a peer review is like to have a lower or like any review is to have a lower threshold, right? So that yeah. it has to have a, a specific quality, but it does not determine uh, how good the paper is because this is determined by what the community likes. So I don't know, there seem to be so many better ways to ensure that um, a paper has a quality than to e either of the of the things. So, so for instance, why not? I mean, it's very outside out, out of the box, but let's say uh, it's just open, uh, everything yeah. is open, and uh, you can you can endorse endorse the paper, and your endorsement counts more if yeah. you've been endorsed by a lot of people before. So, like, it's a, a weighted endorsement, and if this endorsement reaches a critical threshold, then it is like open to citation or whatever. Uh, and you can cite any yeah. any that has some endorsement. Then you, I mean, you would get rid of of uh, of peer review. You would get rid of of um of this of this thresholding the only thing that cannot be substituted is the improvement through peer re review because if you if you hand it into a journal and then you get feedback that's actually valuable from the peer reviews i don't know it would maybe it's like a preprint into full print period where you still get feedback and can improve on on your work but i think yeah. this, something like this the fact that this not ex doesn't exist is crazy to me I think this is all uh, inherited and it's all legacy from the times where internet was not a thing because, you know, then the, the editors had to send letters, receive letters, organize things together. But right now, actually, the figure of the editor is uh, in this process, it's a bit uh, like an annoyance. Why should you wait for the editor to receive the two reviews and then do something, the two or three reviews and then do something with, with that when you actually put, can receive the review in real time and maybe the the other review the the other reviewers can receive the first review also in real time and they can adjust their comments instead of these rounds and rounds and rounds or maybe it's also... decentralized right or like make the review process decentralized and uh, it's like a currency a currency is if you review paper and uh, it benefits you to make it easier for other people to review you or something like this it's so crazy to have this this overhead on, on communication to find reviewers. And you know, uh, also something that I forgot to mention is the fact that um, there are a lot of news uh, nowadays about editors being receiving money from, I don't know where to publish this paper without the review, blah, 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 blah. That thing happens and is allowed because everything is closed door, so you don't know what's going on with the paper. But actually, if you need to go through this loop of, okay, just publishing this in this open archive uh, openly for everyone to see, you cannot pay for it to be published. I mean, because where is the where is the referring done uh, for this paper? It just passed through. No, it should not. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. I... For me, it's also interesting in this direction to have like this notion of uh, public review somehow, mm -hmm. because uh, okay, you are maybe the the author of a scientific work, but the mm -hmm. works at some point belongs to to the community. It should be open work, no? So people can also contribute to your work, meaning that mm -hmm. as of now. I'm not really that incentivized in providing a, a really nice review. I mean, if I do a, a good yeah. job, if it, it takes one week to review a paper or one hour or 
I don't even read the paper. It's 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 fine. But if I like a work and I want to put effort in reviewing the work and providing feedbacks, maybe somehow can be also part of my evaluation as a scientist, like recognize mm -hmm. my contribution to that work. So somehow my reviewing is like it's I'm not the author of the paper, but still there is another level of contribution, right? Yeah. So it can be recognized that. And I, I, I like this idea of having this more, uh, uh, yeah, more efficient way of using the, the internet as basically. Yeah, or, or, even, or even, I mean, this might be a bit more um, controversial, but even a writing system, like, because I, I read many papers, some papers, I think they are brilliant, they are, they are great. Some papers, I think, like they are a bit poor in, in methods and things, or, or or they are not mature enough. And all this information that I have, that I gathered, that I spend time reading the papers and evaluating and see what's there or not. I mean, even having just a review system of say five stars or whatever, and leaving a comment like a review of saying, "Oh, okay, I like this to whatever, whatever." This very simple thing, it would be actually very useful. Although I don't know how, how it would be taken. By the community or how that's cool. It would be like <laughs> like letterbox where you can rate uh, all the you can see all the papers that you reviewed and rated. That would be yeah. funny. Yeah, yeah, I was also thinking about the letterbox, which <laughs> which is nice because one thinks that having a rating system mess things up, but letterbox be uh, at least works pretty pretty good even if random people can vote stuff because somehow they care, and so. And it's very obvious yeah. that it's personal, right? It's like, yeah. oh, I think this is this. Does not mean it's shit. It just means um, I like a romantic comedy more than a horror movie or whatever. I like hypergraph more than pairwise interactions. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I think the the main dra drawback of this is the fact that uh, well, it's an unwritten law of the internet. The fact that when you open a forum to the public all hell is bound to break loose at some point. Uh, but it can also be fun. So I'm waiting for this to, to ah, happen. But maybe, let's say maybe you have to connect. So you have to have an account that is connected. So your papers... To our, to our, our seed, right? Or yes. To... Yeah. So uh, if you write bullshit, then people can say, oh, this guy wrote bullshit. I will write bullshit back. <laughs> So, yeah, there, there could be yeah. some yeah some reputation or some things or, or some some way. There could be like a minimum. Okay, you need to have at least say three publications to be able to to yeah. comment and review because it's assumed that if you are you are starting, maybe you don't have yeah. the ability to evaluate as as well. Yeah. Um, then then my 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 question is like okay, it's very very actually. This sounds great, and so many things I, I would love to have that in, in my. But then the question is, how could this happen? I mean, who would be implementing it? Who would be maintaining? How well, could? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's a straight answer, but I think that the same thing happened with open access a few years back. So. 10 years ago, no, nothing was open access. Nowadays, yes, uh, here it's like, oh yeah, gold open access, open access, blah, 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 and you have to pay a lot of money. But still, you get some kind of possibility of open access. So at some point, I think this will happen because there are these initiatives, like the one I told you about SciPost. There are already these journals trying to actually do the the good thing, because it, it frees uh, everyone of, of work, it frees editors, it frees reviewers, it's it's good for everyone. Um, and if it's good for everyone, um, maybe they will implement some way to pay for uh, reviewing or to pay to do something. So there, there will be money involved for sure, but uh, it will, I hope it will uh, take place at some point. It should have been done by any international funding body by now because the the inefficiency of of 
funding research and then half of the i don't know how, how much but let's say half of it goes into uh, fees for publishing it's just that does not make sense so they yeah. they would use just all of this money to to finance a free publication system or and pay people to review or whatever i mean this would just be resolved overnight yeah. and the fact that they don't do it this means they have no economist that looks at this properly maybe or i don't know or um, maybe not a lot of people know about this yeah. i mean i just told you about this kind of uh, model so that's why we have to spread maybe the word I think the hardest link is uh, between our community that, I mean, the community, I mean, each community that can implement whatever they want and agree on what are important work and, and so on, like the scientific work. But also there is this link to more real world in which people need to be evaluated, for example, in universities. Yeah. And that's the hardest <laughs> part as, because you know, universities are, are not famous for being efficient or yeah. open-minded. So, sure. I don't know. If people, in, in my dreams, people can be promoted because they put a lot of effort in having a, a blog in which they put really nice scientific work, even if not like peer-reviewed or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, that, that is also scientific contribution or having like uh, reviews as I, as I mentioned, but I feel it's very hard to convince institutions to in this. In, having a, like journals, journal titles, it's way easier to evaluate people because you yeah. read that and yeah. That's true. So, Nice. Very interesting this discussion, by the yeah. way. I, I like that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like uh, in, I, I'm reading a lot on this stuff. And some days ago, uh, Stanford University contributed uh, publishing, no publishing, like releasing a, a archive like system with comments so people can upload papers and having feedbacks like archive, but with comments basically. And uh, so I feel like people are trying to, to do some something like this. Mm. So well, let, let's yeah. see what, what happens. Yeah. Oh, we <laughs> should push for it. Oh. Yeah, yeah. We should move. I mean, we have the new, we are the new generation. So mm -hmm. yeah. somehow we have some power on that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for the discussion. It was super interesting. Thanks uh, a lot. I think we can thank you guys. end up here. Thanks, Gonzalo, again. And thank you. We'll see you in the next summit. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye.